Welcome to The Bridge Online. No matter where you're worshiping from, we're so glad to have you with us. You're going to notice the stage is being renovated, so please bear with us as we make some updates to our sanctuary. With all that said, let's dive into the Word. Romans chapter 13. Let's read the first seven verses together. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are, for they are God's ministers attending uh, continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs are due, fear to whom fear are due, and honor to whom honor is due. You may notice I'm struggling, I'm choking on these words as I'm reading them. What is this? How did we get here? It's in the Bible, you see it, God's word. I'm so thankful, on a serious note, that everything that's important in our lives, guidance is given in the scripture on how we're supposed to address it, right? And we see that this morning. That's what we're seeing. Here's some things we need to know. God has established three institutions. He established the family. He has established government. And he's established the church. It's no coincidence that all three are targets of Satan. You see, the enemy knows that when these institutions are healthy and functioning in God's ways, people are happy and fulfilled. The Bible gives clear instruction today on how these institutions are supposed to function, but more importantly for us, it details how we as Christians are supposed to engage in them, right? You will find throughout Scripture how to be a good husband, how to be a good father, how to be a good child, if you will. You you will find throughout the scripture what a healthy church is supposed to look like. And throughout scripture, you will see what good government and authority is supposed to be and look like, but then you also see how we as followers of Christ are supposed to engage. In the verses we just read, of course, the focus is on government. It's a sticky subject, right? Maybe now more than ever for my generation, at least. Um... Lots of of vitriol, lots of division, many, many opinions. And so it tends to be a topic that sometimes we shy away from, but we can't. Like for for one, we can't because we're studying the book of Romans and it's right here. But but the reality is, as I was thinking about it this week, I thought, God, it's it's just like you to have perfect timing. Because as a nation... We are getting ready, and maybe we're already there, and it's going to, I think, just ramp up from now until November. We're in an an election cycle, election period. Um, I think as the people of God, we are going to have to be equipped with God's word uh, in the days and weeks ahead, okay? Because I think it's just going to get worse. I think the vitriol, the anger, um, the deception, I mean, it goes on and on and on, right? Right? It's going to get worse. I don't sense that it's going to get better necessarily. So we need to be rooted in the word of God and and rooted in in truth. Now, you have to remember that this teaching in Romans chapter 13 is based on the premise that starts in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. So if you were with us last week, you saw that there was a shift from theology and doctrinal teaching to now where Paul starts off the 12th the 12th chapter by saying this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. He's still, it's it's still teaching, right? Everything we talked about last week is just continuing on into the 13th chapter. In in other words, 
He's saying based on all that God has done for us in Christ, this is how we should live. This is how we should behave. And in this particular portion of scripture, this is how we should engage or behave in, 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 with, with authority or with, with government, right? And it's not just government. It's not just politics. It certainly is, but it's also all authority. Now, typically when it comes to politics, you have two types of people in the church. This is what I've seen. You have those who think there should be absolutely no involvement whatsoever, that the church should just stay involved in church business, that's it, nothing else. They have been called separatists. And then there are those who think the exact opposite. They believe that the church should be absolutely engaged in all aspect of government, that in fact the church should be the greatest influence on politics. And those folks are referred to as activists. But as is often the case, the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle, right? The best practice is probably somewhere right in the middle. You see, the Bible doesn't give us a crystal clear guidance as to which political party we should join as Christians. That's the truth. Now, you have to remember the scripture was not written specifically or uniquely for for Christian, uh, American Christians. It is a universal book that transcends all nations and all cultures and all governments, right? You have to remember that as you're reading it. The, the, the scripture doesn't tell us specifically how we are to be citizens of the United States of America. In fact, we have to, we have to work through those unique for us, really, those unique benefits and blessings and freedoms that we have. Because today, if you're, in, if you're in other nations that don't have the government privileges that we have, you're reading this from a different lens, right? And yet, there's still clear absolutes. So what I want to focus on this morning are the absolutes. I don't want to, get, I don't want to go down kind of any rabbit trail necessarily. I think if we will focus on the clear truths of Scripture in regards to government and politics and authority, we'll be just fine, okay? And so we want to look at these. If you're writing them down, there's just a few clear absolutes that I believe there's no argument about whatsoever that will help guide us to live healthy, prosperous lives in, in terms of how we engage with, with, with leadership, authority, politics, and government. So number one, the first thing that we have to remember, there are two kingdoms and they're in conflict. There are two kingdoms. Turn to John chapter 18, if you will. John chapter 18, and starting at verse 36. I just want to read this, and then I'll explain the context. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is is not from here. Verse 37, Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Okay, so many of you know the context, but what has happened is the Jewish leaders are afraid that Jesus' continuing teaching, preaching, and miracles are going to diminish their authority, right? That was really the heart of the whole story, wasn't it? Jesus comes on the scene and he is revealing this new kingdom, this to, new to the people, this kingdom of God. That's what Jesus preached. He preached the kingdom of God. He preached the kingdom of God is here. It's nigh. It's before you. And all of his teaching is kingdom teaching. Okay? The, the, the Pharisees, who were religious leaders and by this time are extremely corrupt, right? They love authority. They love power over the people. They love their influence. And they're beginning to recognize that this te these teachings of Jesus are attracting the masses, right? Like, how I mean, you know, you, you start healing my mother-in-law, you start raising my kid, I'm going to follow this guy. And so that starts to happen. And as it does, the Pharisees, really out of jealousy and out of anger and really trying to hold on to power, they begin to devise a plan. We know it. We know the plan, right? The plan is to falsely accuse Jesus bring him before the Roman authorities because the Jewish authorities, it wasn't, it wasn't legal for them to, uh, to crucify or to, to murder Christ, but the Roman authorities could. So they're going to bring Jesus before 
this, this total, this authoritarian government, right, that has overtaken Jerusalem and Israel. And Jesus here, as he stands before the highest authority in Jerusalem, Pontius Pilate, he makes it very clear that there's another kingdom. Now think about this. Think of this. Think of the context of this, of this engagement. You have Pontius Pilate, who is representing the, the, the greatest power known to man of that time, the Roman authority, the Roman, the Roman Empire. It, it, was, it was the modern-day America of that time, probably even maybe in authority and stretch and reach even greater in some ways, okay? And here is Jesus standing before the highest, the highest figure, at least in representation in, in Israel, in Jerusalem, it's Pontius Pilate. And he says to him, this is what I think he's saying. He's saying, you have a kingdom, but I have a kingdom. Are you with me? There's two kingdoms. There's another kingdom besides the kingdom of Rome. And so Jesus is beginning to teach this principle, the kingdom of God. It's a kingdom that all Christians are a part of. We have become citizens of the kingdom of God the moment we choose to follow Jesus Christ. This kingdom is not of this world. It's rooted in truth. The Bible teaches very clearly that it's a spiritual kingdom, that it is eternal, that it will last for all of eternity. It is here on earth now, but it's also in heaven. And so there's, there's portions and parts of it that we read about and we understand through Jesus' teaching that are here and now, but we also know that it's eternal and it's going to last forever. Jesus is the king of the kingdom. Amen. Let me say it again. Jesus reigns as king of this kingdom. Say amen. amen. And then, of course, we know that there are the temporal, physical kingdoms of this world. And that's what, that's what, that's what he's teaching. Right? That's, that's, what, that's what he's expressing. In the 19th chapter, in the 10th verse, Pilate says to Jesus, are, are you not speaking to me? Now remember, Jesus has this opportunity. He's got the, he's got the guy that holds his life in his hands in front of him. And, and as you know the story, there's this sense that Pilate doesn't necessarily want to crucify Jesus. Right? There's some stuff going on that he's, in, it, it, it appears that he just wants to wash his hands. In fact, he even says that he wants to just give him a beat down and then send him on his way because he doesn't want to deal with it politically, okay? And so Jesus has this opportunity to appeal for his freedom, right? To, to be his own lawyer, so to speak, to represent himself, but he's not speaking. And it, it's blowing the mind of Pilate. He says, are you not speaking to me in the 10th verse? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? And Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above, from the Father. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. And, and so Jesus is teaching this very clear print. Listen, as I look about our current society today in America, the greatest nation, in my opinion, to ever exist on planet Earth, okay, and yet you look at our present society, I'm more and more thankful than I've ever been that I'm not only a part of the United States, but I'm a part of the kingdom of God. All right? And I think it's something that we have to remember, right? When, when, when the frustrations begin to rise, when, when things are not going the way we know they should go, not just the way we think they should go, we know it's obvious, it's clear. This isn't right. This is wrong. This is unjust. This is unhealthy for society as a whole. It's not just that we want our particular way or our particular political party to have its way. We, we can see injustices. We, we, can, we can identify things are going the wrong direction. And there's a frustration that begins to rise in our hearts. And folks, you have to decide. You, you have to, you have, what is it? What are you going to do? You know, you're, you're living in a society. We're going to talk about some things that you can do. But usually it kind of leaves you feeling very helpless, right? And I think there's a lot of people in America today that are feeling that way. They're feel, feel, feeling what they call disenfranchised. I don't have a say. I don't have a voice. Things are not going the way I want them to go. Well, folks, I'm here to tell you that's been, that's the history of humanity. It's always been that way. And it's always going to be that way with earthly kingdoms and earthly authorities. But thanks be to God, we know 
that we're not just citizens of the United States. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. Amen. And in the kingdom of God, there's always justice. And it's always right, right? And it's always good because Jesus sits on the throne of this kingdom. And so the, question, the next question that begins to arise is, okay, I get it. We're a part of, the, we, we've got, there's two kingdoms. But how do we live in two kingdoms? Because that's really the question that begins to rise in our hearts. And so that leads us to the second biblical truth this morning that we have to, that we have to uh, build our lives on. And that's this. Every believer has dual citizenship. Every believer has dual citizenship. Turn to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, very familiar story. And you're going to see that Jesus actually teaches the principle of dual citizenship. Mark chapter 12, starting at the 13th verse. Then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians Herodians to catch him in his words. When they had come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we, shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius, that's a, that's a coin, that I may see it. So they brought it and, said to, and he said to them, Whose in, image and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. And they marveled at him. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. Story. I, I think as, as this is as much applicable to our day as it was when Jesus spoke it 2,000 years ago. This is so applicable to us. Jesus is teaching us the imperative of dual citizenship, Right? Listen, you have, to, you have to understand something. The Pharisees and the Herodians were not friends. This is literally like a Democrat and a Republican coming and joining together. The only way you can get a Democrat and a Republican together is to kill Jesus. That's not it. Just relax. I'm just using that as a... Listen, F Pharisees were right-wingers. Herodians were left-wingers. That's the truth, right? They did not like each other. They did not support each other. They did not believe in each other's agendas. But in this particular moment, they're united because they literally want to get rid of Jesus, right? And they devise this plan. They think, like, it doesn't matter what he says. Whatever he says, we've got him. Because if he says, pay taxes, then all the right-wingers are going to want to kill him. If he says, don't pay taxes, all the left-wingers are going to want to kill him. Sound familiar? And Jesus, you can't put Jesus in a box, you can't, you can't trip up the wisdom of the word, the whole wisdom of all man and all humanity. He is Christ. He has all knowledge. And so he gives this amazing answer. But, but folks, you may not understand the depths of it. Listen, listen to what he says. When, when, when the politicians, the religious politicians, if you'll just allow me to say it that way, they were the religious authorities, the Pharisees and the Herodians. When they use the word and they come to Jesus and, and say, shall we pay? The translation in the Greek means this, shall we just give something? Okay, this, this, is, this is what they're saying. In our language, it would have been this way. Jesus, shall we just give something? When Jesus replies, he uses another word. It's translated in the English both to be pay or render. It's the same, but it's a different word. The word pay for, for the Herodians and the Pharisees meant just give something. But when Jesus responds... He uses another word, and it means to fulfill a debt. In other words, Jesus is saying, you have an obligation to Caesar, and you have an obligation to God. You have to get this this morning. He's teaching you. He's just telling you very clearly. This is still applicable for us today. If you are a Christian, and you believe the word of God, you have an obligation to the government, and you have an obligation to Christ. You have an obligation to government to be a good citizen. And you have an obligation to God to be a good citizen. That's the truth. That's what Jesus is teaching. And, and so it, he answers this question and it, it, they have no argument. How can you argue that? And I guess my question to 
modern day American Christian today is how do you argue that? It's clearly spelled out in scripture. You have an obligation to the government that you're a, that you're a citizen of, and you also have an obligation to God. Now, I know where, where, where the mind goes in this. Listen, your first and foremost greatest obligation is to God. And the day that you put, get put in a position where you have to choose between the two, you always choose God. No one's suggesting otherwise. And while some Christians throughout the world and the globe are being put in those positions, you're not. I know you think you are, but you're not. You're not there yet, folks. Are we heading there? It sure appears that way. It does. And we'll talk about that. We'll just just relax. But as of right now, you had all freedom to get up, come to the house of God, lift your hands. You can go into the public square. You can shout. You can preach. You can preach against homosexuals right now on the town square. You can. You can preach against Muslims on the town square right now. You can, you can share your opinion publicly all, on all the formats that you have right now in America. Am I right or not? Come on. Hmm. And so right now, as we stand today, we have this opportunity where we, can be, where, where we can be good citizens of the United States of America, while at the same time being good citizens of the kingdom of God. You, you see, true followers of Christ will be faithful in their citizenship on earth as well as their citizenship in heaven. Go back to Romans chapter 13. Let's read it again in light of those statements. Let me, let me read you. Romans chapter 13, verse 5. This is the Bible. Therefore, you must be subject. Like, that sounds like a command to me. Quietest, the quietest sermon I've ever preached. I, it's all right. I knew it was. I just got to make sure I don't get all round. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. Go ahead. For because of this, you also pay taxes. Wow. I don't like it. You know, sometimes I get accused of like, oh, he's pushing an agenda. He's, I don't like this. I'm telling you right now. Before God as my witness, he knows my heart. I struggle. I don't like this. But the word of God is an authority in my life. And so therefore, I choose to honor and obey what God's word says. I don't have to like it. It's not about my feelings. It's not, I, I, don't, I don't serve God and only do the things that I like or that I want or that I even agree with. This, you know, you hear me sometimes talk about, you'll read the word of God and the word of God will cut us. It will go down to the bone and to the marrow. There are things in God's word that are absolutely contrary to our sin nature. In my opinion, and for some of you, maybe it's not that extreme, but for, in my opinion, many of us, this is some of that, right? This is just stuff that we struggle with and we've got to wrestle with internally and personally, individually, and, and I don't corporately, I suppose, to some degree, and just be like, this is what God's word says. And I'm not going to look for some like some nuance that says, no, he didn't really mean what he says he meant. No, he, it means exactly what it says. And so we're commanded by God to do this. Because of this, you pay taxes. Why? Because these are God's ministers attending con con continually to this very thing. One more verse. Render, therefore, to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear, that means respect. Fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. You see, he's not talking about a person. Did you know that? He's not talking about a person. He's talking about a position. And today, you and I struggle because we see the person, not the position. And how many of you know, there are a lot of times that the person 
in the position is very flawed. Okay. And, and, and so what we want to do is say, if the person aligns with, with me in the way that I like, I will honor them. But if not, I won't. But you're not obeying the word of God. It's not what the word of God's calling us to do. You honor the position. Why? Because the scripture says very clearly the position was established by God. In fact, twice it says that people in positions of authority are God's ministers. That's how I've read all week. Could we have stopped this teaching at like 12, 12? No, you see it. It's very clear, right? And so it rubs us the wrong way. But it's, listen to me. This isn't, this isn't like, this isn't in scripture. God's not like, I'm going to write this and just really watch how I get everybody all riled up. He, it's all for your benefit. It's all for your benefit. In fact, let's start back at the beginning and read it now, not from the lens of, I want to be rebellious and I don't like authority, but think of it now in, in, the, in the light, in the lens of you and your family and how it may possibly be for your benefit. Listen, let every soul, you don't have to put it up, I'll just read it. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. Those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Listen to this, verse 3. Rulers, authority, right? Governments and authority figures are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Now, here's where we struggle. Because there are corrupt leaders. And sometimes corrupt leaders go ex completely contrary to this. You can be, corruption is there's something good happening. There's something good taking place. And yet the person is corrupt. Okay, that means it's out of the will of God. Corrupt leaders are out of the will and the plan of God. Listen to this. <clears throat> For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. This is a general principle, folks. That means this. If you don't want to deal with authorities, then don't do things that are contrary to the laws that are laid out. I remember years and years ago as a young Christian, just, just new to the faith and knowing I could pray and pray for anything. And I, I, felt I just had a lot of faith, a lot of zeal. And I, I, had, I had a speeding problem and I would just speed all the time. And I remember I was just flying and I, the lights, you know, they turn on and I started praying, oh God, just let me not get a ticket. Just let me not get a ticket. And I, just the lesson that the Holy Spirit taught me from that. He, and, and it was something like this. This isn't, this isn't audible or word for word how God spoke to me. But it was basically like, okay, when you overeat and you begin to get disease, you want me to heal your disease. When you break the laws and you want me to come behind you. In other words, you want me to come behind you and fix all of your known obvious sins and errors and mistakes. But you want to keep doing them. That's called presumption. And presumption is a sin. Man, it just felt like, can we at least just get out of this ticket and then we'll talk about that later. <laughs> well, folks, it's the truth. We all know this principle, don't we? Just a reminder this morning is all it is. Now, have some of us in this room done good and still been mistreated? Yes. Is that corruption? Absolutely. Is that contrary to God's will and plan? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. That's not the norm. And that's not the plan of God. That's not the will of God. Are you with me? Okay, make, make sure we understand. And so you see, it says this, <clears throat> distributing to, uh, wait, I'm sorry. Uh, verse four. For he is God's minister to you for good. How can authorities be good. Let's maybe reframe this thought this morning. How, how can authorities be good for you, right? They're good for you because the role of government, we're going to get into this in a moment. Don't write it down because you can write it down as a point. The role of government is to restrain evil. That's the role of government. And right now, even though we're watching 
we're, we're, we're watching corruption and crime and, and sin and evil kind of rise on levels that we, it's just not healthy. The reality is, for the most part, we live in a very, very peaceful society, right? And if you look at it very locally, we live in a very peaceful society. And so when you, I, I was raised that when you saw a police officer, you hid. True story. God is my witness. Pass a cop, you hide. Hide, get down, get down. So it took some changing for me. Now I don't hide from the police. I never taught my children to hide from the police. Why? Because they're God's ministers to protect. And I begin to realize once I start having my own family on my own possessions, right? My own property, my own goods. I started to realize I'm glad they exist. They're not just there to give me a speeding ticket because I want to speed and they don't want me to speed. That's not their purpose. Their purpose is to protect, right? And, and even like their motto, to protect and to serve. And so we have to understand that this is what God is calling us to do. In fact, it does lead to the next point. If you want to write it down, you can. We struggle with understanding the true role of government in America. Would you agree that that is what our number one argument is about today? When you want, I, I listen to a lot of politics, a lot of talking heads, and most of it, if you boil it all down, it's to arguments of what they believe the role of government is. Isn't that where we're at in America? Anything you listen to politically right now, think about it. It's going to be an argument. You're going to have the, the left, you're going to have the right, you're going to have conservative, you're going to have liberal, and they're going to be saying, no government should be doing this. No government should be doing this. No, this is the role of government. This is the role of government. The Bible defines what the role of government is. Are you with me? It, de it defines. And we need to understand the role of government. It will help. I promise you, it will help you. It will help all of us. It will help me. This is why God, this is the absolute. This is the truth that we need to stand on. God in his sovereignty has allowed and even placed government authority in their positions to fulfill his purposes. That right now, while you're watching and I'm watching what looks like to be chaos, God is in control of it all. God is in control of all of it. It's not chaos in heaven. It's chaos to you and I, but God is sovereignly governing over all of it. That's why he says they're his ministers. They're his ministers for good. And so today, whether you live in communist China in America, or if you would have lived under Roman authority back in the day this was written, the role of government has always been the same. And it is ordained by God to restrain evil. That's the role of government. Our problems have come because that role, from man's perspective, has increased exponentially. You know that? Like That's the truth. Because we've got government involved in things that government shouldn't be involved in. That's where we all get mad. Because either they're involved and we don't like the way they're involved, or they're not involved at all, or, or they should be doing it this way or that, and that's what we argue about. When in reality, the scripture teaches very clearly, listen, their main role, the number one role of government is to restrain evil so that the purposes of God can be furthered. That's the reality. And, and today, especially in America, we just, we don't see it that way. Now, folks, it does not mean that God condones the evil that comes from corrupt governments. You, you look at some of the governments of the world today, whether it's in China or North, <clears throat> North Korea or Iran, these places, they are there, according to the scripture, ordained by God to be there. You cannot deny that. But that does not mean that God condones their corruption. It doesn't mean that he condones their evil practices, their oppression, their persecution. He does not condone it. Here's the question that you don't know and that I don't know. What would come out of some of these nations if there weren't strict governments? I, I, this, is, this is just so beyond our thinking. It's beyond my thinking. But you look today, and we can just use the political climate of today, in Haiti, where there is almost no government, 
genocide is widespread right now. That's just, that's just literally hundreds of miles from our borders. Did you know that? Probably not. You don't see it on the TV a lot. There's no government in Haiti right now. It's absolute anarchy. I don't know. I'm surmising. Maybe I shouldn't, and I'm going to move on because I don't want to get in trouble. And I don't wanna, but I'm surmising that those people right now would be fine with even if it was a dictator coming in and cleaning out all of the evil that's taking place so that they could just simply go to work every day. So their kids could just be fed. So that they could be safe on the street. Are you with me? And, and so we just, don't, we just don't see things like even that is just a terrible analogy. Like we just don't see it from God's perspective. But what we know from God's perspective is he puts governments in positions so that those authorities will restrain evil. That's the reality. And those that are corrupt, the, those government authorities that are evil and corrupt and persecuting and, and, and withholding freedoms from the people, they will stand in judgment and give an account before God and they will be judged by God. He will take care of it at the end. And you have to trust in that. Either you believe vengeance is the Lord's or you believe you're the one that holds judgment. The Bible is clear that God is the one who holds judgment. So, so in light of this truth, what is our response? We, we go right back to Romans chapter 13, verse 5. Here's the response as we get ready to close. Just very simple. For us in America, I believe if, if you're going to live your dual citizenship to the best of your ability, you first look at your United States citizenship. And today, you have the privilege, the opportunity, the ability to be a good citizen. What is a good citizen? I think a good citizen is informed. If you want to, if you're asking me, this is just my opinion, not that it matters, I shouldn't give, but here's my opinion. Right now, the number one enemy of the people in the United States of America are not politicians, but it's the media. It's the media. Because right now, it's very difficult for the average person to be truly informed. What station can you turn on today and not hear a slant? What, what station, where can you go to hear g real news? Now, if you're a liberal, you think it's MSNBC. If you're, a, if you're a conservative, you think it's Fox News. I'm here to tell you, guess what? You're not getting the whole story from either one. That's the reality, folks. And it's the biggest corruption. And to me, I tell Cheryl all the time, I'm like, how do these people get away with this right in front of our eyes? They're, they're literally snakes, right? I mean, it's just, I'm just, I don't know. It's just the truth. They're withholding information. So as a good citizen, it is our responsibility to dig a little deeper, search a little further before we just react. Maybe we don't believe everything we hear on Facebook. Maybe it's not everything. I maybe everything Tucker Carlson says isn't the gospel. Maybe those crazies at MSB and NBC are crazy, and you're not getting the whole truth. Like I'm just saying. It is your responsibility and mine to be more informed. Okay, then when we're informed, then we engage. Because we can. We're allowed. We're in America. Right? This, this, I'm able to preach this to us today. We, we have this freedom to engage. And what does engagement look like? Man, there's all kinds of opportunities for engagement. Right? You can, you can petition your congressman. You can petition your senator. You can, you can make the phone calls. You can, you can sign up, you know, and, and I, I want to, I, I, think, I think abortion is the number one issue. I think immigration is the number one. I think I, whatever it is that you're passionate about, that you're, that you're learning about, that you believe is not biblically accurate, you have avenues to advocate for that position. So my question to you as the church is, are you advocating or are you just complaining? Ooh, I know the answer. So do you. Think of how silly this is. You're just going to get yourself all frothed up and angry? 
and, and let, the, let, the, let them play you like a puppet? You understand that's what's happening? They're treating you like you're unintelligent. And you're buying right into it. You and me, we buy right into it. We repeat what we hear on television. We repeat what we hear on social media without engaging, without finding out, without calling, you know, specifically from the horse's mouth, what can I do? What can I, what, how can I do this properly? What is the right channel, right? Because we believe that we have no say, we're disenfranchised, so we, we, we divest to just complaining. You're a Christian. You're a child of the king. You have dual citizenship. Be informed, be engaged if you want. If you, but here's the other thing about it. If you're sitting here thinking, man, this sermon's wearing me out. I wish you'd just move on. And you don't really, you're not that concerned. You don't have to engage. Just keep serving Jesus. You're fine as well. It's like it doesn't have to be one or the other. Like we said at the beginning, you, you can do either. But if you're someone who's like, I just, I'm so angry, then engage. How about running for political office? How about getting up behind someone who you know is biblically strong and supporting them? I'm, this is a suggestion. It's a freedom that you have. It's something that you could do. The, the, not, the, the next thing that you absolutely can do, in fact, that you're commanded to do is Pray. Are you praying for your nation? Are you praying for your leaders? Are you praying for wisdom, praying for direction yourself? Th these are things that you and I have to consider because these are, this is what good citizens can do. Th this, is, this is the freedom that we've been given in this nation. And so what I'm saying to you in America and American citizens is utilize the freedoms that you've been given. I, I think in this room this morning, I know there are just different levels of, of, of desire for engagement. Some of you want to be very political. And if you feel drawn to that because you've prayed and you've sought the Lord and you feel drawn to be political, then let the Holy Spirit guide you. But here's what you're not going to do. You're not going to force the church to follow you. Because the church has bigger fish to fry. Let me explain, because that's where we're going to get to. Because the, 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 the church has a bigger purpose, universally. Individually, absolutely. Utilize every resource that you have. Let the Holy Spirit guide you and go all in. But don't expect the church is going to do it, because that's not the reality. Listen, we have to understand this morning, as we get ready to close, we have to understand that government has no power to change people's hearts. I'm going to say it again. Government cannot legislate sin out of the human heart. Nor is it God's purpose for government to transform our culture. Do not fall into the trap of believing that government has the answer to making culture better and more Christ-like. That is not government's responsibility. You know whose responsibility it is? The church's. You like to repeat a, a phrase. Do you know what Jesus meant when he said, you, the church, the body of Christ, my followers, are a city set on a hill. You are the light of the world. You have the power, the message, the power, the message that can transform a human life. Government doesn't have that. Correct? And so quit, quit expecting government to make a, a, some kind of utopian society or bring about righteousness. That can't happen. Do not be deceived this morning into believing that any form of earthly government or authority has the answer to society's problems. Folks, we have a massive sin problem, and only Jesus Christ, Savior of the world, can fix it. That's the truth. <laughs> government does not have an answer for the sin problem. Have you figured that out yet, right? Government does not have the answer for the sin problem, but who does? The church of Jesus Christ. Turn to 1 Timothy quickly. Put it on the screen, please. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. We'll go 1 to 4. Therefore, I exhort. This is, this is, this is our response. Exhort means I'm telling you. Get it done. First of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, hang on, that's a comma, for kings and all who are in authority. Ooh. 
we're supposed to be praying for our leaders. Why? Because we honor the position. Look, I'm going to speak from my heart, and I hope I'm not out of line. It's difficult today to respect individual leaders based on their character, based on who they are, and based on decisions they've made. That's not what you're called to do, though. If they are in a position of authority, the Bible has already taught you that God established that position. And so your requirement is to pray for them. But listen, this might help. There's a reason, right? That we may, we, who's the we? Notice the difference, right? Like we, the Christians, the salt of the world, the light of the earth, the light, the salt, the city on the hill. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I want to remind you as we close that the ver- all the verses of scripture that we read today, including this one, were written during a time of great persecution for believers. As corrupt as you may think our current government is, the Roman Empire was far worse. It was marked by deep corruption, injustice, infanticide, slavery, homosexuality, widespread sexual debauchery. It was the norm. And so when you're reading these verses of Scripture, don't be deceived into thinking, yeah, but it wasn't as bad as it is today. Very similar, probably. Maybe it was worse then. I don't know. But we know that this, and this is what's being, this is what we're being taught. In this verse of scripture, we're being called to pray that things would go well in government so that we Christians can be about our business. Notice there's, remember, we got dual citizenship. And so now I'm talking to you about the second responsibility, the second obligation that you have, and that is you are, an, you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. And that's where your first business um, lies, folks. I, I see this verse. I remember hearing someone years ago say this. He said, the economy in America does best when government is in gridlock. And that kind of shocked me, and I thought, that's odd. I thought, but I know what he means now. Well, you know what he means? That means they're not passing any more laws. We need them to settle down on the laws sometimes. Like, you need to just slow down, guys. Like, you need to can I keep, keep your fingers out of stuff, right? Have you ever felt that way? And so that's what he's saying. He's like, that's when government's the best. I think, this is my opinion, I think that's what he's saying. Like, tell, just pray that they'll just get off on something else and that they'll just be occupied with something else. That way, that way they're busy doing their thing so you can be busy doing your thing problem in the United States of America today and the problem that I see for this summer is many of us are going to get swept up in things that quite frankly it's of no value it's of no value folks we, we, we are a part of the kingdom of God and that is the most valuable calling that you and I have you see it's the church not government that is the hope for society do you believe that Let's come and sing. I'm going to ask you that again because I want to just drill this home because that's what this whole sermon boils down to. You can disagree with things that I said. I don't. You can't disagree with the Bible. I mean, you can, but good luck. But the real question becomes, do you believe that it's the church that holds the answers for what ills society or do you believe it's government? That's the challenge. That's the challenge for every one of us. And if I genuinely believe that the church of Jesus Christ, the believers, that's people, it's not an institution in and of itself, but the people, God's people, hold the answers to what ills society, I'm going to be spending all of my time there. That's what I'm going to spend my time on, right? Yes, if if God puts it on my heart, I want to utilize every freedom that I have. I'm, I'm all for that. But I don't want to get caught up in that unless I feel a specific call by God to go into politics. And some people do. And God bless you. That's a great calling. 
if God calls you to do that. But if not, actually, even if you are, you're still working for the kingdom of God. You with me? Does that make sense? So you've got to decide who, who has the answers. You and I as Christians are called to teach the ways of Christ. We're called to love others, show them the love of God, to serve others, and to make disciples. And it's a very special calling that needs to be the central focus of each and every believer. Stand with me all over the building as I read Romans 13 now and close with chapter or with verse 8. If they want to follow along on the screen, they're just going to close with the word of God. Listen, yeah, I'll read it from the screen. So he says all of that about government in the first seven verses. And then he goes right into the eighth verse. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you should not commit adultery, you should not murder, you should not steal, you should not bear false witness, you should not covet. And if there is any other commandment, they are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this knowing the time. That now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly, as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you guide us. We thank you that you bring sermons like this just at the right time for us. Lord, our prayer is that we would not get trapped. That we would be clever and wise. not completely disengaged from politics, not sticking our head in the sand, unaware, uninformed, but at the same time, not allowing our spirits to be burdened, angry, vitriolic, harming our witness of love, generosity, and kindness. God, help us to balance this. Come on, all over the building. They're going to just lift your hands. Let's pray that. I don't know how you could, if you don't want that prayer, I don't know what the hell, I can't help you. Just, Lord, help us to balance this. Will you just, right now, all over the building, God, as we go into this year and this summer and this election, help us to balance it. Lord, there may be some people in this room that you're calling to be more engaged in politics and to represent you on that, on that front. And if you do, may they do it well. May they do it with humility. May they do it with courage. May they do it with wisdom. But all of us are called to represent your kingdom. So God, today, help us to balance it well. And do it in a way, as the scripture says, that you're honored. That you're honored. And that you're pleased. All over the building. Folks, they're going to sing right now as they sing. Well, if you want to pray, let's take, let's take three, five minutes just to let the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. 